Guess what? No. We're in the last chapter. Last one. Now, Travis told me, though, he wanted to stay till 10 tonight, so we're going to have no work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to hang out, you know. Well, I mean, nobody has work tomorrow, so we're just going to, you know, just stay here and, you know, just, just teach. So, oh, look, Mr. Eugene, we got very little to cover tonight. So, wow. <laughs> oh, you want to stay till midnight? Miss Leela, uh, Mr. Eugene wants to stay to midnight tonight. <laughs> All right, we're going to get through this. I can do this. Y'all ready? Let's yep. get this going. All right, we're going to talk about preventative brokerage. Uh, the broker working for or with the seller. The broker working for or with the buyer. If you remember, what have we already discussed? Have we already not talked about some of these? That's why I can get through it pretty quick. Because we're basically reviewing what we started throughout the class. A practical guide, of course, to the everyday practice using rehearse dialogue, other considerations, and risk management. So, the preventative brokerage, the three routine actions, okay, is number one, you always use written disclosures. Yeah, I know, especially, and Ms. Linda's not here tonight, but I can guarantee you, my agents will tell you they get so sick and tired of all the damn plastic forms that you got to fill out. Okay? There's a ton. But we have to do that so that we don't get what? Sued. Okay? So it's not that I want to do them. I guarantee you it's not me. If it was up to me, I'd be like, let's just do our jobs. But we have so many people that are so happy that we have to utilize these, these disclosures. Okay? So we have to use written disclosures. We have to clarify the broker's role in the transactions and use the help of others when needed. That's the routine. Failure of agent to disclose material facts is always the biggest and most major source of all complaints. Especially if you're a new agent, they don't know what's wrong with the property. Okay? You need to make certain that you ask. If you're not certain, do not assume. You understand me there? If you do not know, you do not answer. You say, I don't know. I'll have to take a picture and maybe send it to my broker real quick. Okay, let him look at it. All right. And also, you need to document that information was provided. See, real estate agents, we get very busy. Travis can tell you, Dave can tell you, Stephanie can tell you, and I can tell you. When a client wants to see, say Miss Davenport wants to see some properties and she's approved for $2 million, okay? My question for you, Travis, is this, or this, is, how it, this is how it works, right, Travis? So she's a pre-approved for $2 million and she wants to see 10 properties. This is how it really works, right? She just wants to see one property at your schedule when it works best for you. Uh -huh. And, and, and then she's not going to try to do multiple ones in different areas. She's just going to fit it around what fits for you, right? Yeah, I love that. That's how it works, right, Aiden? Not, not even close. Not even close. How does it work, Mr. Travis? If she wants to see 10 properties, when does she want to see them? Tomorrow. Or today. You mean tomorrow? Yeah, no, we mean like now. Yeah. Right? I got, she, a, she I, just, got a, I got a message from a client two days ago that yesterday, so the day afterwards, she sent me a message at 7 p.m. saying that the next day she wanted to see a house in Lano, a house in Marble Falls, and a house in San Antonio. Yep. Yeah. And she was like, can we do that starting tomorrow around 11? And I was like, no, like, no, that's not how that works. I can't do that. That's right. So you have to understand that the point I'm getting to that with Travis, imagine if he did do that. And while he's on the phone with you, Mr. Nobles, you're asking about, is there any termite damage or whatever? And he says, uh, no, there's not any termite damage, blah, 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 blah. And he says, I'm gonna, I'll email you after I'm finished. Do you think he has time to really remember to send you an email? No. No. So he didn't document it. And now it's what? It's word of mouth. Wow. And how's that going, portion in law? Not going to happen. 
Okay, so you always got to document what you got. There's also some info on forbidden by the law, and okay? certain things are forbidden. Some sellers do allow exceptions for written disclosures and don't practice where you have little or no expertise. Just because Aiden has a real estate license does not mean that Aiden should be out there selling ranches or selling commercial if he's never done it. He needs to have somebody that's what? That mentors him, okay? Now, does it mean that your broker has done everything? No. No. Luckily, I've been in almost everything. Only thing I've not done, if any of my agents ever asked, of course, Skyrise, I've never done that. So we'd have to bring an attorney in. But I've done most things, probably about 80% of them. But some brokers don't do that. Some brokers only deal in one area. Some will only do property management. Some will only deal with residential. Some will only do commercial, okay? But you gotta understand is you don't practice in an area that you have little or no expertise. And you have to know the different duties that are owed to a client than to a uh, customer. The broker, of course, is always working for or with the seller. And you have to explain and discuss these, deep, these differences in detail, the brokerage's company's agency disclosure form and the broker's agency's position at all times. That's why we use the IABS form. Before an agency relationship with the seller, meaning that there is no listing agreement, you need to still provide an information about brokerage services, a blank copy of the contract. You need to explain what sub-agency is and obtain permission to use. You need to explain how commissions are split, permission to use the MLS, Fees to the buyer's agents, of course, are going to be negotiable, as well as the seller's disclosure and the potential of intermediary status. Now, most of you are probably like, that's a lot you got to do. That's why it's called a listing presentation. Okay? It takes time. You got to deal with some stuff. Don't think that it goes like this. Hi, Aiden. My name's Justin Nobles. I'm a real estate broker. You want to sell your house? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go sell your house. I got a listing. Woohoo! Is that how it works, Travis? Oh, yeah. I'll have a sign down, you're good to go. And that's it. Right, right, Aiden, every time, right? No. No. What happens, Mr. Uh, Mr. Aiden and Mr. Travis? You have to explain everything. You got to take the, you got to submit everything into the MLS, and you got to take pictures, and you got to put a sign. You, there's... you mean you got to do paperwork? Oh, oh yeah. 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 Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. I thought when I watched HGTV that all y'all did was just go out there and show three houses and they pick one and everybody's happy and it just goes perfect. That's, that is how it goes, right, Steph? And that's why we just started the TV no. show. No? You mean that's not how it happened with your client you're working with right now? No. What? <laughs> oh my gosh. Y'all, Stefan's doing something wrong. Because it's only supposed to take three houses and then boom, he picks one and it's done. I'm doing what? You're doing it wrong. You're supposed to do it like HGTV. I never said wrong. I wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the key thing is, is that you've got to make certain, y'all, you're going to run through those situations. Okay? Some of the other steps, of course, is you got to discuss what's the motivation. Why is the seller selling? Answer questions about the listing agreements. Discuss fair housing laws. And I've had to deal with this before, actually, y'all. I've actually had to deal with this. A gentleman, I, an older gentleman that I had went and met with, did not, did not volunteer to meet with this one. I got basically voluntold to go with one of my agents on this one. And I sat down at his table and uh, we were talking and he ended up, he point blank just told us, I ain't selling to no African American people, period. And I looked at him and I looked at my agent, and I was like, sir, I hope you have a great day. And he was like, you're telling me you're walking away from a $3 million listing? I said, yes, sir, yes. I am. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm walking away. Well, you crazy. I, 
don't care. I'm not going to even deal with that because if you're already like this now, I don't want to deal with you in a transaction. So thank you. Appreciate you having us over and, and I will see myself out. And I left. Okay. Because I'm going to tell you from experience, guys and gals, I'm going to tell you experience. When they already give you HE double hockey sticks over something as stupid as fair housing laws, how do you think they're going to be when you're dealing with them trying to sell their house, Travis? It's going to be awful. Horrible. Horrible. Okay? And I ain't risking my license at all because of somebody that's racist. I'm sorry, not doing that. Not doing it. Sorry. So, you have to end up in that situation. It's the best interest that you walk. Just let it go. Even if it's $5 million, it ain't worth it. I guarantee you, I've been through stuff like that. It is not worth it. Okay? You also have to gather data for BPO and discuss with the seller to determine listing price. You have to answer all seller questions and ask the seller to sign a listing agreement. Now, of course, Mr. Aiden can tell us, uh, sellers don't ask many questions, right, Mr. Aiden? Very right. few, right? And they never call you after you put the sign in the yard, right, Mr. Aiden? No, they like to call. They like to call? Oh, yeah. But no questions. They just want to talk to you. I wish. Aiden? I'm pretty good at conversating. Oh, that's what it is. Travis, you don't right. deal with those headaches, right? That is, <laughs> no, it's not at all, right? <laughs> now, once a listing agreement is signed, of course, you're going to end up, you're going to discuss the requirements for a seller's disclosure, discuss staging the home, discuss what personal property will go with the property, extremely important, and I'll come back to that in a second, and show the property and keep the seller informed of the showings, buyer questions, buyer's likes and dislikes, and the overall life. Okay. Now, the reason that you want to discuss the property or the personal property is because here's what happens. Women like to de decorate, right, Mr. Eugene? Women love to decorate, okay? And so when they go in a house, say Miss Linda was in, in the house and she doesn't like the particular mirror on the wall in the bathroom, she could take it down and put up one that she bought at Kirkland's. Nice fancy one that says she spent $500 on Okay? If she puts that up, do you think that she wants that to go when she moves? Does she want that to convey? She wants that mirror going with her. Okay? So, when you meet with a person, say Aiden, you and Mr. Travis are meeting with y'all's client, you always want to ask that client, especially if there's a ton of junk in the house, what do you want to stay with the property? What's going to convey? And it's very important if there's a ton of junk, because sometimes in that junk can be what? Valuable, valuable stuff. So what you have to do is, and I always tell people this all the time, we need to stage the home for showings, which means we need to get all of your stuff, you notice I didn't say junk, all of your stuff, move to one location. And where's always the best location? In the garage. They have a garage, but in the garage. You don't want to do a storage unit, you want to try to keep your cost down. Okay? Now, if they don't have a garage, then yes, storage unit. But you want to put it in the garage. Because how many people go and actually hang out in the garage? Not many. It's mostly okay. open it, look, okay, shut the door. Okay? So, in that situation is you want to put all their stuff in one location. And then what I tell people is when they go show the house, I'll put in private remarks, all items in the garage will not convey. Will not convey. That means everything else in the house is what? It's going with it. But if your client refuses to put their stuff in one location, what happens? It allows for the buyer to go through and be like, ooh, I like this and this and this and this and this. Next thing you know, all your valuable stuff is going. Don't do it. Okay. Can I say something? Yes, ma'am. I went um, years ago with a friend of mine. She was looking for a house. She asked me to go with her. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I already wasn't a huge fan of the house. Uh, she didn't pick it, but I just allowed her to just talk about and walk. Yeah. And they had what? What's the the dead animals they put on the wall? The heads. Oh, the yeah, yeah, the uh, trophies. The, 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 they had all kinds of animals. I said they done went to the zoo and killed all the animals and put them on the wall. <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I was just that that was the last straw of course i had to say something and she would and she saw that too and she was like yeah i don't know if i want to buy here and it was just a turn off just from the last straw with the heads on the wall yes and i'm so glad you brought that up i'm so glad you brought that up when you are staging a house you have to understand you are having the public come into your house okay that means, and I've had that discussion exactly what she's talking about, the taxidermy, basically the, the trophies is what they have all the time. They put them out. I told a client, I said, those all need to be put in storage. They all need to be taken down. And they told me, they said, why? I said, because you gotta understand, not everybody that walks into your house likes to hunt. Not everybody has the same hobbies as you. So you have to take those down. And my client refused to take them down. And exactly like Leela said, we had people come in and look and everybody told us, I don't want the house because of that. And I kept relaying that to my client. And eventually my client finally took them down and allowed me to take good pictures again. And we sold the house. You gotta be very careful. And with that same statement, I will tell you this too. I have dealt with people that are religious and not religious, okay? Your key thing is you need to, when you're, when you're representing a client, a listing, a seller, say Mr. Eugene, in your house, your wife, Miss Linda, puts up family portraits everywhere and they have, and she has crosses everywhere, blessing, all this throughout the whole house, okay? and say that Mr. Aiden is an atheist, he loves the house, and he walks in and he sees all this stuff. What's he gonna most likely do? He's gonna walk back out. You're turning away your audience. And he may have cash. But let's flip it. Same thing with Aiden, or with Aiden. he say he's an atheist. And I've seen this, by the way. People have had People, literally, no joke. And it was in Houston, by the way, Miss Miss Leela and Mr. Enrique. It was in Houston. I had a, a showing that we were going to. We went into this house, and they had a shrine to Satan in the house. It was in the living room. Okay. Mike. For real. For real, no joke. For real. Wasn't huge. Was not a big thing. Don't think of it large. It was just a. It's kind of probably no bigger than probably like this, like this fan the height and all. It's real small. Well, it was like a goat head and all that. Yes, thing. not the bridge, like the the bronze stuff. Oh, you see what I'm saying? But they had it on there. That's creepy. My client saw it, and my client immediately was like, "I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Get me out of here." You always have to understand your interest while it is your house, when you put it on the market, you, I'm not, I always tell people, if this is what you believe in, that's you. I respect that. That's the, you have your right to do what you want. However, you got to understand you're going to have people coming in this house and going, not everybody's going to agree with that. And it's going to take away from others. So you're hurting yourself in that situation. You're going to be dealing with those things. And I guarantee you, once you get your real estate license, I'll, sometimes you'll see, especially, I'll see little funny things that are posted and I'll share it with some of my agents sometimes as I see them. But there are some strange stuff you will see in bedrooms, especially the master bed. okay? So I'm just fair warning you, you always need to make certain that you contact the other agent and ask, is there anything I need to know in particular about this certain house? So that you can do what? You can prepare your client 
fort. And from a security <laughs> standpoint, it is not wise for you to leave pictures up of your family in a house. Especially in a time, Oh, I know. It's not a wise idea. I've been in a showing here. I've been in a showing in this town. A client I found off of our lead generation called me. We went and saw a house. And guess what I found out? You know why the lady was wanting to go in that house? Because she thought that that woman was ending up cheating or something like a big old mess. Huge situation. And we had to deal with that. You take your photos down. You don't want people knowing where you live. See what I'm saying? Safety issues. Don't do it. Okay? Take those photos down. They don't need to be up. Once an offer is made, relate all offers to the seller. What's that keyword there, Mr. Grossman? Right here, look up here. All. All. So does that mean you just pick which ones you want to send? No, it means all. <laughs> and you assist in negotiations. Once there is a contract, these are your elements. These are the things you got to do. You got to make certain that the earnest money has been deposited according to the contract. Encourage the seller to make any necessary repairs. Keep in contact with the seller regarding updates from the buyer's agent. Request to see a copy of the settlement statement before closing to check for errors or omissions. Tell the seller what to bring to closing and attend the closing if required. My recommendation, you always attend the closing. There should be no ifs, ands, buts, okay? If you can't make it, somebody from your office needs to be there, period, okay? The reason I say that real quick before we jump over here to the next one, is there are times at the closing table, and I've had this happen before, agent got sick in the morning, couldn't make it to closing, while the agent called her client, told her client, well, I'm sick, did not call me, her broker, did not tell me, called her client, said, you can go on over there and just meet them and just sign, just meet up with the seller and the other agent, but did not tell the selling agent or, the, or anybody, anyone except her, nothing. So they get to the closing table and the selling agent ain't even there. The buyer's agent's home sick. So here we got the seller and the buyer sitting at the table and they started bickering. And next thing you know, the buyer's agent gets a call. My agent gets a call and the buyer says, screw this, I'm out. Ended up the entire transaction fell apart because they got in an argument. You never ever allow your seller or buyer to be alone with the other party because it can be very bad very bad very quickly people are more nicer if you're sitting there as a representative because they're going to keep they're going to be professional but if there's nobody to hold them back they're going okay now when you're dealing with the buyer you need to present, of course, the IABS and explain the services to that buyer. You need to discuss the fee structure, explain the items in the buyer representation agreement, discuss the policy on intermediary, provide information to the buyer, especially the IABS, the mode information, lead, fair housing, and gain written buyer representative, uh, representative agreements. After y'all have signed that agreement, you need to create a profile of the buyer's needs and wants, identify the properties and present to the buyer for review and set up appointment to view and discuss the importance of the seller's property disclosure. When there's an offer, you're going to assist the buyer in making that offer, answering any questions about the contract, delivering that offer to the listing agent and facilitating the negotiations and counter offers. <clears throat> Once everybody has signed, you need to track all deadlines, deposit earnest money, assist buyer and obligations and deadlines for those items, such as loan applications, inspections and appraisals. As closing is nearing, 
You need to make certain that all contractual obligations and contingencies have been fulfilled. Tell the buyer what to bring to closing and attend the closing if required. Now, the key thing I want to say before we jump into this next one <clears throat> is this happens sometimes, okay? You have to make certain, and you have to understand this from this situation. People, we all do this, but what happens is, is it, it's just, I guess the thing is, is you get tired and you get the check. So Aiden, we're going to say, you just closed a transaction with Ms. Davenport. You've been working with Ms. Davenport for four months. You finally found her house and she's closed. And the title company calls you and says, the transaction has funded. Now, what do you think Aiden's focused on right now, Mr. Eugene? My money. I got money. My money. Woohoo! I'm rich. I'm going out partying at Northgate tonight. Woohoo! I'm taking Leela out. And we're all going to go party. Miss Dad, we're all going to party. Oh, man, let's go. Hey, there you go. Right, there you go. <laughs> so, so he's all happy and he's going and all. And he's like, man, I don't have nothing else to worry about. <laughs> Guess what he does? He goes and does all that. But one thing they didn't say up here was, Mr. Grossman, what did I tell you today? When you thought, oh, I'm done with this. What did I tell you you were missing? And people forget this all the time. Um, what did you have to go get? I to get the checks. No, after you did all that. I told you, don't forget before we come to class, make sure you go out and get it before class. Go to the sign. The sign. People always forget to get the sign and get the lockbox. They always forget it. And let me tell you, if you don't get that sign the lockbox off before that funding, and Miss Davenport just bought that house, and my sign's still sitting on there, it's now, her, it's now her property. So it is imperative because let me tell you, I've had this happen before with some agents. Say you just closed on Friday, hey. Monday comes around, I get in the office and I sit down and I'm like, okay, did you, where's the lockbox and the sign at? Oh, I'm going to go get it right now. Too late. That sign's gone. And Miss Davenport's already cut that, uh, that lockbox off. So Mr. Aiden, here's your bill for those two items. Uh-huh. See the problem? You always get your sign and your lockbox. The lockboxes are not cheap. No, one lockbox costs me about 200 bucks. One box. Hmm? You don't want to pay $200 for a lockbox. Just the frame of the sign is 100 bucks. Then you got all those inserts inside. So you probably get hit with four or five hundred dollar bill because you were just focused on getting your money, okay? That's why it's always imperative. And that's why in my office, we're trying to finish it up, is getting a checklist. Because when there's a checklist, what happens, Travis? It makes things what? So much what? So much what? Smoother and easier. Slower, right? Horrible, oh, right? Awful. Terrible. No, it makes it just smooth, like you said. Yeah. Slower, easier. I mean, quicker, smoother. Just, yeah. just check it out. So, again, always be prepared. Again, other broker is buyer's broker. Again, they have to list to all listing brokers if they're going to be working uh, with that one. Disclaim any agency or sub-agency relationships with the uh, seller or the seller's agent. The listing broker or the buyer customer, okay, when they're working with the buyer customer. Again, you still got to give the IADS, but if they're a customer, you have to disclose the difference between a client and a customer. You got to explain to them. When working for a seller, you have to be able to understand the differences. Sometimes you will have to use technological advisors. And we may move from a customer to client if they agree to a buyer rep. Sometimes there can be in-house sales policies. 
competing buyers, properties for buyers, especially on the MLS, and miscellaneous topics. When dealing with listing broker or buyer brokers, if offered, if the offer is received from the buyer's broker, we have to be cooperative, resolve commission issues quickly and promptly, make the seller aware of all fees and offer the represents the buyer's interest. So you have to be very careful when you're representing a person that is a customer versus a client, like we spend a lot of times talking about. The other broker is a sub agent of the seller instead of the buyer's broker is that the information of inf information of brokerage services have to be provided. You have to end up again talking about that seller sub agency to the buyer, explain any limitations of service, <clears throat> notify the listing broker of any sub agency, as well as verify those commission splits, act in the best interest of the seller and inquire about listing brokers procedures. The key point that you have to always remember is the intermediary status because it reduces the agency relationship for both the buyer and the seller. Like I said earlier, you have to be very careful when dealing with the intermediary. You must get the written consent of all parties. You must treat them all fairly and honestly. You have to avoid disclosure of confidential information even accidental confidential information. You have to determine when and if the appointments will be made and comply with trailer. So a practical guide to everyday practice using the rehearse dialogue. Okay. There are example dialogues for brokerage situations that you can always rehearse. There are two scenes, one talking about agency relationships to the prospect to talk about the exclusive seller's agency and one discussing a single agency. Again, you can practice those presentations for you in regards to the defense of disclosures. Now, what about these other considerations? Again, any presentations of offers by a listing broker needs to be done in a proper way just like presentations of multiple offers and backup offers. Now, one question they're going to ask you on the test is about multiple offers. Mr. Aiden, yeah. if you get multiple offers on Ms. Davenport's listing, do you have to give them to her in the order, in the chronological order that you've received them? Um, I mean, I hope you will. I mean, once you get it off, you present it to them. Say that Ms. Davenport so, yeah, says, yeah. say Ms. Davenport says, I'm going to Miami because Justin has driven me crazy in these classes and I'm going to Miami this weekend. When I come back Monday, I want to see all the offers. Okay? Yeah. Ms. Davenport tells you that. Okay. When she comes back Monday, you've gotten 20 offers. Do you have to present them to her as they came into you? No. in order no. why not they came in order if travis submitted it first why should why why shouldn't travis's be the first one on the table what isn't that fair travis you're the first one why shouldn't he have first dibs yeah. <laughs> because Ms. davenport was lucky enough to leave the week that she got 20 offers so <laughs> i'm going to present them all present them all at once you present them all to her at one time and most of the time, you're going to present them how? Lowest to highest or what? Highest to lowest. Okay. So it doesn't matter if Travis presented his or gave it to you the first one and Stephens was the last one. If Stephens was the highest, what happens? He's going to be the first one. <laughs> now, let me ask you this, though. If you got 20 offers and Travis submitted an offer, should you not go to Travis and say, hey, man, we got 20 offers. Can you put, submit your highest and best? Yeah. Can you do that? Yes, yeah. you can. And you Without should. Consulting her at all? You can do that. Okay. On that point, you can. Okay. Now, it's wise 
to talk to Miss Davenport before you do it. But if she says she wants to be left out of it and she wants to be left alone, you could say, hey, Travis, I'm not trying to start a bidding war. I'm not trying to do this, but I want to let you know we have multiple offers. So if this is y'all's best, that's great. If not, you know, I'm, I'm going to present them to her Monday. I just want you to know we do have other offers on the table. And then he's going to probably, well, no, 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 you don't. You don't no, tell I mean, that's what he's thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's thinking. He's thinking. Not but, he's thinking. But, but he cannot, if Travis says, well, what are the offers? I can't, tell. can't tell you. Just give me your highest and best. That's all I'm asking. And Travis may say, he may do this. And I've had this happen before. Travis may tell you, you know what? Y'all are just trying to do this bidding crap. Give me out of it. I, I res we rescind our offer. Well, okay. But you never want to do that with two, because I've seen I've seen it happen before, mm -hmm. where they went in and they said, "Well, we want the highest and best in both of them." Hang out. Then Miss Davenport's going to be furious because you didn't talk to her first. Yeah. Make sense? <clears throat> Presentation of backup offers. Sometimes Miss Davenport may accept Mr. Stephen's offer, but Travis may want to go in as a backup offer. He may, he may hope that it falls through and he's next in line. However, talk to your broker on backup pro, uh, offers. I do not personally recommend it because you're locking your client up in a transaction that may or may not close. And they can't buy another house while they're in a backup. Okay. You also need to discuss how earnest money is dealt with. I always tell my clients this all the time. Once you sign this contract, you have blank days to get out. You have your option period. You have seven days, you have 10 days, you have five days, you have whatever days. You have these days to bag out. But, but, understand Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so, after that time, basically kiss your earnest money goodbye. Even if the contract says that you get it back, you might not get it back. Okay. So understand that you need to explain to them how earnest money works. You also need to explain to them how commission works. I've had clients before say, so I got to pay you 6% and I got to pay the other agent 6%. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. We split the 6%. I can't. That's right. You're giving me six. I'm, I'm giving them that. And then I got to do a split with them. So as when I actually, I remember when I was in my training, I was at a 50, 50, I remember trying to sit down and explain it. And he's like, so let me get this right. I pay you six. Well, I'll pay your broker six. And then I'll pay the other broker six. And then your broker gives you three and he keeps three. And this broker gets three and three. And then, and then y'all pay taxes out of that. Right. And I was like, no, you don't pay 12%. You pay 6%. And by the time you split it down, I'm getting one and a half of 6%. Oh, that's not good. That's exactly what he told me. And I was like, but I explained to him, I said, I'm a newbie. I'm still learning this. And I said, I will, it will pay off down the road, down the line. Yeah. I just have to pay my dues. You know, it's, it's just like anything else. You got to pay your part. And, uh, but yes, you have to explain your commission. And I will tell you, sometimes my biggest thing when I do listing presentations, I really don't spend much time on offers and stuff. I spend the majority of my time right here at commissions because people don't understand how commissions work. They just don't know. Okay. And then of course, written agreements. Again, with presentation of offers, you got to present all offers. The broker cannot, very key here, broker nor agent cannot accept or reject offers. It's not your job. They fully have to explain the terms of the offer and maintain the confidentiality of the offer. That's why, Mr. Eugene, like I said, if Travis was to ask him, what are the offers, he can't because there's confidentiality that applies. Okay. When there's multiple offers, simultaneous offers, you're going to have a second offer while the seller is considering the first. This can occur, and it does often occur, but here's the key thing, like Mr. Stefan learned the other day, is if your client 
submits a counter out to an offer. Say Mr. Grossman sends you a counter back to your offer you sent. And then Ms. Davenport submits Stefan an offer and he counters that one. What happens now, Mr. Grossman? How many contracts you got out there? Two. You counter two. Oh, you count. Oh. So he has two out there. Now, what happens if this happens, Mr. Eugene? Mr. Eugene, you and Ms. Uh, Davenport both send Stefan at the same time acceptance. What's happened now, Mr. Grossman? I don't even want to deal with that. So it's like, how can you be? You're in contract with two. Yes. And I've had that situation arise before. And it ain't pretty. It does not sound like it would be. It's not pretty. Because you're in contract now with two individuals. That's why you only counter one contract. And if Miss Davenport submits another one, you rescind your counter and you let both parties know that there are two people that are now interested. We want highest and best. But Travis can also say this. When you're busy, are you thinking about all those little bitty things like that? No. Because you may be out showing Aiden some properties, Miss Leela some properties, Garrett some properties, and you're on the phone talking to Stefan, and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll counter that. And then you talk to Miss Davenport, yeah, 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 we'll while you're still showing. And next thing you know, after it's all done, you get two emails from both of them accepting your counter. And then you sit down and you're like, oh, what did I do? Okay. That's why I always tell people all the time is, and I try to try to tell even Miss Linda, in this business, you have to stay in control of the situation. That means that Mr. Travis, if Eugene calls you and he's saying, hey, I want to talk to you about countering, ignore it. Ignore the call. Ignore. And he calls you again. Ignore. Send a text. I'm busy. I'll talk to you in a little bit. And then Mr. Eugene sends you a text. Well, blah, 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 blah. I need to know. I am in a showing. I will contact you as soon as I'm done. You are in control. Don't let people pester you. Okay? Because if you let them pester you, I guarantee you, you're going to end up, you're going to end up in that situation. Then you have a lawsuit. You're in control. Not them. Y'all have a, I think it's now 48 hour rule. You only have to get back to an agent within 48 hours. I think it is. I have to double check that. It, it was 24. I think they moved to 48. But you have to now. It's a key thing. Now, Travis can't just ignore Mr. Eugene for three days. He has to call him back. Okay? But normally, and this happens, there's some agents out there that will do this. Mr. Eugene, you'll call Travis. He won't answer. Call him again. He won't answer. You text him. He won't answer. And then guess what he does? Calls the office. And then he calls and gets over to Miss Linda and starts chewing out Miss Linda, which then Miss Linda or anybody that gets that call is freaking out. Like, oh my God, it's important, it's important. And then they call Travis. Travis answers it and makes Travis nervous. And so Travis is like, yeah, yeah, we'll just we'll counter it. Don't do that. You're in control. You just tell whoever calls you. I will call Eugene back at my time. Not at theirs at my time. Okay. When dealing with presentations of subsequent or backup offers, the seller already is under contract in this situation when you're dealing with backup. You have to also understand that Mr. Grossman, we've dealt with this too. You cannot, and Mr. Travis, this actually comes to your what we were talking about too. You cannot have what's called torturious interference. Remember your client wanted to call, have you call and try to break the whole thing up yeah. and all that. If that would have happened, now you could put, face civil charges is what could happen. You can never, say Ms. Davenport's under contract and Mr. Aiden, Mr. Eugene's over here telling you, uh, she's under contract to buy a property that I want. So I want you, I want you to go in and screw up her contract so that I can get the property. And Mr. Eugene keeps demanding that, demand, 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 demand of you, okay? And he keeps telling you, you do that, you interfere in this situation, you end up, you now have torturous interference, 
and they can end up suing you. Okay. A lot of people get mad at me, especially people that are pushy. I've had my fair share of these over my years. And there are always people that have a lot of money. Had one in Austin. Guy ended up, you know what he did? The house, he found out through the grapevine that there was supposed to be a showing on this property. And the listing agent had got the call. I'll play it out real quick. That's how it kind of was. Make these for you. So Miss Davenport was called on her listing because of her sign. Mr. Eugene, you called Miss Davenport and said, I saw your sign and uh, I called a friend of mine and they're going to come out and they're going to want to look at the property. Miss Davenport said, sure, sure, just my sign's out there. This client of mine called Miss Davenport inquiring. Did I give his name or nothing? Just called and inquired. And Miss Davenport said, well, we already have somebody coming out. You most likely going to buy it, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, so most likely you're not going to get it. You know the client did? My client went to the property, poured it over there, took the sign, threw it in the back of his truck, and drove off with it. So he couldn't find the property. Because you had to see the sign to know where the property was. And so he threw it in the back, and then he called me and said, now I want you to go over there before they put a contract in. I want you to try to get me in, blah, 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 blah. They wanted me to interfere in a contract that they were already working on. And I said, no, I won't do it. He got livid at me. And I said, I'm not going to jeopardize my license. You got a ton of money. You're well off. I lose my license. I have no money. I'm not going to do it. And he fired me. And I said, that's fine. Go. Cool. You're not going to push me around and make me lose my license. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to do it. Okay? But that does happen. There are people that are like that. But, yeah, that was the funniest one was when he called me. He's like, yeah, I took the sign and I threw it in the back of my truck and drove off. And I'm like, oh, so you stole something. Okay. Now, I really want to get involved in this yeah, transaction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, again, Trek also does have contracts, though that permits seller to accept backup contracts. But again, always talk to the, uh, always end up talking to the uh, the broker on a backup before you do it, because you want to make sure you do it right. Retain your earnest money, okay? It's not to not addressed by trade contracts and also the some listing contracts do permit it. Uh, brokers rarely, rarely actually pursue this. I don't personally, but there are certain ways that you can try to keep the earnest money or how it's dispersed. Commissions, again, they're negotiated between the broker and principal. The person that actually negotiates the commission is the selling agent, not the buyer's agent. It's the seller. There, of course, is, and this is a test question, there is no set fee. They will say this on the test. Aiden went and spoke with Mr. Eugene, and Mr. Eugene said, Mr. Uh, Aiden, the standard fee for real estate uh, representation is 6%. Is that correct? No, there is no standard fee. There is no. That's the normal. That's the normal, but there's no standard. Not a set fee. Okay. The listing broker controls the splits. Also, the clarifying of the fee before the showing of the property, you always want to have that in writing. Can't tell you how many people are going to throw a sign up and end up in that situation. Uh, they go over and they end up, they do the fee and they don't, or they put up the stuff and everything, but they don't end up, they don't clarify the fee. The broker does have a duty to cooperate with other brokers but only if the cooperation is within the best interest of the client. Cooperation does not necessarily mean compensation. Okay. Written agreements are strongly recommended. Buyers, of course, are included because they're not customary. They fear additional fees, fear of commitment to one agent, and may not understand the benefits of representation. Okay. So in these situations, one of the key things that you want to make certain of is that you have to be certain by all means that additional fees should not 
buyers basically don't want to be hit with additional fees. When they see those things in there about you owe me 3%, you owe me 4%, all this, it freaks them out. Okay. But again, written agreements are always key. Risk management in this situation, of course, is to develop the written office policy manual. That is a broker's obligation, not an agent's. It's required by TRALA. It's also important that the broker, I'll just tell you, it's just cheaper to go on your broker's insurance policy. Don't go get your own E&O. You don't know, talk about it going through the roof. If Aiden, you were to go get your own E&O, it's going to be through the roof, just by the way, because you're one person. When you have a group of people, it's cheaper. Okay. Um, so get, get E&O, and that's normally on the broker. And it also is recommend your area experts. Okay. Don't allow, say, Stefan, he's just trying to get a transaction. So he goes and says, I do all of Texas. Okay. No, if Stefan's a new agent, Stefan needs to find an area first. Get used to it first, then he can do what he wants. Okay. But he needs to know what he's doing. You don't just immediately jump into it. Uh, also, use written disclosures. The key points is to use written disclosures, clarify the roles, use services of others, and develop written policies and procedures. Prepare clients and customers for thorough expl their explanations. Present all offers promptly, and discuss earnest money retention. Commission is always negotiable. Oral contracts are okay, but it's always best to get it in writing and always use rehearsed dialogues, okay? For the broker, you always wanna practice real life situations in a classroom training, document topics that are covered in those trainings and identify participating licensees. So Mr. Travis, I'll let you come up now, if you don't mind. Mr. Aiden, come up, please, sir. I'm going to let y'all three knock out these. How many were discussions? Number three. Huh? There's number three. Phew. <laughs> How many is there? Uh, six. Six. You got six. Uh, oh, man. Get up there. Get up there, guys. How can a listing broker protect themselves from liability for the wrongful acts of an authorized sub agent? Uh, Keith, give me again. Okay, um, I would say uh, with that, the broker would have to uh, have like a broker protection clause or would that, that work? Okay, you're close. Um, you would need to get E&O insurance, like Arizona Emissions Insurance, which is on the broker, like Justin was saying. Um, okay. And an office policy manual. Also be gotcha. Thank you, sir. All right. What should sellers be told about the listing broker splitting the commission with the following the sub agent and the buyer's broker? Mr. Garrett, if you're there. Um, that it's not like a set commission, that it's, the commission is like. There's no standard commission? Yeah, it's made by the listing agent. Okay. Or the broker. Okay, and what else would you say about the whole, how he was talking about when they have the questions about, am I going to use 6% and also this person 6% or how does it play? Like, remember what he was saying about that? Oh, that the agents decide how it's split. And there's Pandal. So basically, you're right, yes. But what I was kind of getting at was like the listing broker, basically, you're, oh, the, the uh, seller is only paying the listing broker. Yeah. They only pay and, the 6% commission or whatever you set up to them. And then the listing broker is when he splits it with the sub agent buyer's broker so that the the seller is not the one paying out commission to everybody. They just pay the list. Yeah. All right, yeah, good. How should listing brokers handle an offer submitted by a buyer's, buyer's broker with a request to pay the buyer's broker out of the sales proceeds? Um, 
Miss Layla. Oh. <laughs> Miss Layla, he, he did that to you, not me. I don't mean I got an answer. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> she got you there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, okay, next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> number four, number one. Uh, who else? <laughs> hey, Aiden, there's a dude out here. Oh, yeah, Mr. Cool. Nobles. <laughs> Which one? Which one? There's two of them. Yeah, there's two. Which one? Oh, no. Did you say that one more time? I said, do you think it's allowed that, that the buyer's broker can uh, request to pay? Well, it's saying the list broker handles an offer submitted by a buyer's broker with the request to pay the buyer's broker out of the sales proceeds. Is that allowed? I would say yes. Exactly. So how should they handle it? Um... Should there be an agreement? Definitely. Yeah, there should be an agreement. There you go. There's your answer. Gotcha. Travis. Uh, what procedures should a cooperating broker follow in working with the following buyers, a customer basis and a client basis? That one I would ask Mr. Eugene. <laughs> we'll let Miss Davenport help you, Jacob. Oh, no. The customer, you can't do uh, You got a lot of answers. Uh, a customer, what do you provide them? Can you provide them advice? No. Can you negotiate with them? That's right. Can you negotiate with them? Client, you can uh, opinion and. Right. Everything else, but customer, you can't. You want to give them more things. Uh, That's right. You yeah. need to. You need to limit. So it's talking about what's the procedures. With a with a customer, you should always end up in that particular situation. The customer needs to end up. They get the bare bones. Yeah. Right. It's the they get material facts, honesty, fairness, the basics. With a client, I can actually give them advice, opinions, and things to that nature. So you need a strict procedure on how you're going to differentiate the two. Make sense? Next question. And the next question lists three good reasons for reducing to writing a buyer's broker arrangement. My gentlemen in the front, all of you, what's the answer? What? Why is that written like that? That's weird. Reducing? What do you mean reducing to writing? So each one of you give me a good reason. Because you can. <laughs> so what's the reason? <laughs> what's the reason? Hey, what's the reason? Why do you want to put something in writing? Liability. Yeah. What'd you say, Travis? Liability. Number one, liability. Travis. I mean, uh, Aiden. Uh. Stole it from you. Risk management. Risk management. I'll give you that one. Hey, it's all on you now. Yeah. <laughs> do you not want I mean, the duties? Just so you have it in writing. So do you not want any, Do you want the duties wrote out? What you're going to do and what they're going to do? Yeah. So you need to know what your job's going to be, right? Oh yeah, sure. There yeah. you go. Know the job. Next. That's it. That's it. That's it. 
All right, go ahead and uh, go ahead and stop the recording tonight.